Good morning, everybody. It's mornings with me. Um, so before I actually start getting into mortality rates and trends, I have a book recommendation, especially for policymakers. A Journal of the Plague Year, I mentioned this in my prior video, by Daniel Defoe. It's based on the, la the Great Visitation. It was the last big outbreak of plague in London specifically, but it did spread to other places in England. I mentioned, so this is from 17, was it 1722 is when Defoe published this book. He was a little kid himself at the time of the plague. Uh, so this is not based on his personal experiences. This book has been called a historical novel, which I think is misleading. Uh, it's more or less non-fictional account of what occurred in London. It's interspersed between official government policy, official government statistics, or church statistics, but that was part of government, Church of England, yada, yada. Um, uh, the state of the art of the science of the day. Uh, I was actually taken aback, and it was towards the end that Defoe mentioned the use of a microscope, um, but mentioned basically uh, they were kind of thin on the ground. And I did look it up. Yes, microscopes existed around then, but of course they were very, very high end scientific instrumentation at the time. It was started in the Netherlands and really hadn't gotten you know, much into England. You have to remember, so a lot of Americans, just a lot of modern people don't have a good sense of history. We're all what, always embedded in the now. Uh, but 1665, the only reason I remember this is because 1666 was the year of the Great Fire. And a lot of the reason I, I remember all of these other than 1666 is of course a very catchy year number is The Baroque Cycle uh, by Neil Stephenson, which covers this period. Um, there's all sorts of things that were going on in history at the time. Um, there had been the, uh, and I don't even remember the timing of everything, but you had the Puritans taking over killing Charles I, and then you had the Protectorate with the Cromwells in charge. Um, and the Puritans taking over, and then you had uh, Charles II coming in, um, and it goes on from there. But you have to realize this was part of what I would call the modern period. There was a scientific view. They knew quite actually a lot about infectious disease at the time, but they couldn't do much about it. Uh, they did not really have effective treatments. And the plague in particular is problematic. Um, Isaac Newton, uh, like infamously, the, the universities were closed and he went back home and, you know, yada, yada, gravity, blah, 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 calculus. Um, so Newton was operating this time. The Royal Society was operating at this time. Um, when we say the Baroque period, 1665, if I remember correctly, is when Bach uh, was born, and I think Handel was born the same year. In any case, it's a modern period. It really was a modern point of view, and they get a plague. And they knew a lot about the plague, uh, because evidently there had been a wave of plague uh, in the 1650s. And then you think, well, what's, what's the deal here? And it has to do with how far the plague spread each time um, before it burned itself out essentially. And that's what we're working through right now with coronavirus. Okay. Um, though now we, we have a little bit uh, better grasp of infectious disease. We still have a lot of the same problems that existed that Defoe is pointing out in Journal of the Plague year, Because between this is what the government policy was. Uh, for example, if there was known cases of plague in a house, they basically, now they didn't wall you up like they did in Milan. Now, and that goes back to the 1300s, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but they would set guards outside of a house to try to make sure people didn't escape. But you need to think about um, these enforced quarantines of, at least now we have Netflix and things that can um, distract us. 
And the other thing we need to remember with regards to the plague versus coronavirus, the case fatality rate is quite different. Um, forget about the age profile of who's dying and, and how you died. There were three forms of plague and all three of them appeared um, during 1665. There's the pneumonic plague, it gets in your lungs. Um, and evidently the way most of these people died is they felt just fine right up into the moment that all of a sudden they didn't feel well, they had to sit down and within an hour they were dead. There you go. Uh, there was the septicemic plague where it gets in the blood, 100% death rate from that too. And I, and there are things that indicated whether you had that or not, um, that they could tell after you died. Uh, but again, these tended to be out of nowhere. Um, but yeah, it, it evidently came with a lot of pain before you finally died. And then there was the part, the form that you could actually survive, and that's the bubonic plague. And you had these buboes and these lumps, and I think they were inflamed lymph nodes um, that would swell up and be hard and you'd ache everywhere. That had only an 80% fatality rate as opposed to 100% for the other two forms. So you can imagine this was quite dire. And if you were in a family where someone caught the plague, and then everybody in the house is walled up together, obviously you're going to have a situation where almost everyone ends up dead in that household. We'll come back to that in a bit. So what is this book like? It's the story of H.F. Um, and you can see here Daniel Defoe's uncle Henry Foe uh, is probably H.F. And it was probably his, he would would have been an adult during the plague, and he probably told stories because most of these stories ring true, and I'm and I'm not trying to go the fake news route. What I mean, and Daniel Defoe, you need to remember, was a journalist, uh, that the kinds of human behavior you hear about, the, I mean, my favorite bit is where he talks about the scamsters um, and what happened with them. I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's obviously based on anecdotes, stories that he had heard from people who had actually lived through the plague, even if it wasn't his uncle and other ones. And some of them, he, the author himself says, I don't think this is very credible. Okay, some of the stuff that involved supernatural happenings. Um, it's, this still is a fairly scientific point of view. They did understand people were catching it from each other. They didn't know about the rat vector. Um, but it sounds like most of it was person-to-person -person, uh, transmission anyway at this point. And they knew about that. And they knew about asymptomatic spread, that someone was spreading plague before they suffered any symptoms for quite a bit. That's also going on with coronavirus now. Um, we may, it, one of the issues that we have is the testing for it. Let's forget about for a moment that, uh, you know, not everybody who's asking for a test can get one. But even if you are tested, there is a question of how reliable these are. And there's the phone. So what had just interrupted, and I'm going to edit that bit out, was a phone call from FedEx about a very uh, anticipated package that's going to be coming here. So that's one thing they didn't have back in 1665. Um, I think you're going to find it a lot easier to have people compliant uh, with staying home. But the problem is there's too many people, of course, who have even tested positive. And I, I've had a couple of friends, and no, this isn't friend of a friend. This is a friend where people who had tested positive came into work or whatever, even though they were told to, to quarantine. They, no, they had a positive test. What the hell? Okay, don't do that. Um, they didn't have such positive tests, but uh, back in the plague days that said the symptoms of plague were undeniable back then. They couldn't be confused for the flu. Um, and that's part of what Defoe gets into is he does get into how the whole way the um, disease progressed and how people suffered symptoms and what happened with the people who survived. I said uh, bubonic plague had an 80% fatality rate, which of course meant 20% survived. So you have that to uh, think about. And he also talked about, he doesn't mention it too often. Uh, so the Great Fire in London, of course, was in 1666. That actually may have 
killed off, I mean, killed off the rats, killed off the fleas to keep the plague from coming back. And my understanding is 1665 was the last big plague outbreak in London. Um, you might want to think about why certain infectious diseases come back in waves and flu pandemics are actually something, and this is not flu, obviously, something that comes and goes a lot. The plague itself has actually preceded the Black Death of 1348. There were various plagues. We don't know because we can't test, but there's uh, good indications, at least with the 1348 ones, that's the Yersinia pestis, or however you say the actual name of um, the bacterium that causes the plague. Okay, getting back to this. So why should people read this book? Part of it is it will give you perspective of how serious infectious disease had been uh, in early modern, in modern society, and I would say European modernity it goes back before the 17th century, but this is when it really starts feeling modern. Um, when you hear how Defoe talks about this, of course, this is being published in 1722. Uh, even so, um, you get a certain kind of approach that does differ. Yes, there's still heavily a religious component, but that's true up until pretty recently and even now for many communities. So, uh, you know, don't get snotty about that. I mean, I'm a religious person myself, Catholic, uh, but um, a lot of people don't take these things seriously reading it in historical books, and I think you should. But what's really important is for policymakers to think about, because Defoe talks about this over and over again. He really hammers it by the end of the book of what he considered were um, policies that made people desperate, that actually caused additional spread of plague because people would panic and would flee London, taking the plague with them to surrounding suburbs and even further out. Um, what's interesting is there's like a merchant class and HF and the Defoe's obviously were coming from this class that had friends or family or their own property out in the country, pretty far away from London, I mean, for the day tens of miles outside of London that they could have gone to early on. The problem is once plague was raging everywhere, uh, you were likely to be taking the plague with you. If you had left early, maybe you didn't have the plague with you and you didn't spread it to other towns. He does talk about the effects in surrounding towns and not just in London, but the focus is on London. Uh, some of the stuff that was really interesting was that he quotes the stats and he uses the stats. These are the bills of mortality, which has the number of people who died each week, uh, not exactly by age, but you can, some of it's by age, but by cause, which is important. And he talks about not just the plague deaths, but what I, I'm terming excess mortality in general. And that was how he had... Um, proven, as it were, that there were people who were hiding cause of death. Uh, he was also, and I would love to see somebody use the statistics from the bills of mortality being used. And again, someone probably has done this, an academic, an academic of how the plague spread through the various parishes in London because uh, Defoe is making the argument that you can use the numbers to find out, even if it's not marked as plague deaths, you can see that excess mortality, that increase in deaths that you weren't expecting in August of 1665 that was indicating, yes, that was plague, even though it wasn't recorded as plague. I'm trying to find it here. Um, but he had, yeah, here's the one, dead of other diseases bes beside the plague, going from like about a thousand a week up to 1400 in one week and then you notice it comes down um that's a good indication that yeah there was plague there even though it was marked as not plague uh he talked about some of the stuff um <laughs> that maybe were plague fever spotted fever surfate which is supposedly and we've seen this in um like overeating Mm, I don't know, overindulgence, but I don't know if it's alcoholism even. Some of them were hard to tell. Teeth, so 
I was wondering about this. Uh, asked on Twitter when I was reading reading it. Teeth evidently is um, it's it's like infinite in child mortality. It's before you have teeth. So um, it was infant mortality is teeth. But here's another thing to note, and I'm probably not going to find it right away, that he's talking about secondary increases in uh, death due to the plague because of effects. And he was talking about increased deaths in childbirth. It's not caused directly by the plague. It was caused by the midwives either being killed off by the plague themselves because they were attending sick people. Uh, midwives were not only used for childbirth. Yeah, so here we go. Childbed, so that's the women who died in childbirth. Abortive and stillborn, so not, that's not the mothers dying, but the dead babies. And then Christmas and infants. So, um, and Christmas, I believe, I think they are referring to christening uh, there, so maybe pre-christened babies um, and how often uh, they died, that there was an increase. So here we have January and February, uh, weeks and he did a, did a similar period so he he has 48 24 and 100 but then the august to october in the same number of weeks you have 291 61 and 80 and his argument and sometimes he does it year over year 1665 versus 1664 uh, to make a comparison but this is you know evidence-based uh journalism defoe really really was factual based which makes uh, Robinson Crusoe very interesting reading and some of the other stuff that Defoe wrote. Still, uh, the point is he was saying you can actually see the effects. And here it was midwives were dead or gone. So some of them fled London. So you had women who were not attended by uh, experienced midwives. And he also mentioned, and this is I want to close out with are the scamsters because, of course, there are scams going on right now with regards to coronavirus. Forget about people who are just trying to go with something that sounds similar uh, to drugs like so quinine or whatever. And then, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a fish tank cleaner, even though it's not the same thing. It just has like some of the same chemicals. As someone was joking, are you going to be trying to drink liquid oxygen? Uh, because you need water, and water has oxygen in it, okay? So some people are just, you always have this kind of thing. There were women who were claiming to be midwives who had, of course, no experience whatsoever. Why would they do this? Well, this is a good way to make money, uh, especially when you don't have anyone who is actually a good midwife. And then, of course, you might steal all the stuff out of somebody's house who's ailing, who can't do anything about it. And he does talk about people stealing stuff from houses. That was one of the issues. If you had abandoned houses, people would go in and steal stuff. But you'd also have dead people in the house, everybody dead in the house. So what are you going to do? But he also talks about stories of people uh, escaping the house. There wasn't just fraudulent midwives. So there were people who were selling amulets and you know, potions and stuff that were supposed to protect you against the plague. Um, not so much plague cures, people kind of knew all of that stuff was crap, but um, various blessed objects and other things that were from magic. And the comment that, um, let me see if he, is it magic? Where is that? Um, yeah, pretenders to magic to the black art. Uh, here lives a fortune teller. Um, what blind, absurd, and ridiculous stuff these oracles of the devil pleased and satisfied the people, I really know not. But certain it is that innumerable attendants crowded about their doors every day. So people were flocking to anything that gave them hope. Uh, but in the sequel, <laughs> and of course all of this stuff was ineffective, and some of these scamsters, scamsters believed their own scams, and others knew they were full of shit. Uh, in either case, uh, Defoe writes the next year or after the plague wave was over and there was multiple there were a couple of uh, waves and so that's something that we need to consider with coronavirus for right now a lot of the states I'm in New York I work in well I had been working in Connecticut I'm working in New York um, 
that, uh, you know, we're kind of, we're not exactly locked down, but uh, people aren't really moving around so much. Uh, most of us are working from home, except for uh, very specific businesses. Uh, a lot of stuff is closed. Um, that said, when it lifts, whenever it lifts, there's likely going to be a secondary wave of disease because, um, you know, that's just how it works. And he talks about this here where people had fled and then come back to London because this is where the wealth is. This is where the trade is. Um, urban areas are, of course, breeding grounds for uh, epidemics, pandemics. It's hard to do it in a rural population because people don't interact as much. Uh, you need that density. It's too easy for a disease to burn out because you get to whatever population it is and it doesn't intermix. But if you have a city and for London, um, I, I read a history of the city of London once that for a long time, the only thing that kept uh, London's population level, much less growing, was new people coming in all the time to do business because the death rate was far higher than the birth rate in the city. Kind of like New York City, if you think about it. Um, in any case, uh, the scamsters, going back to the scamsters, they, they were pretty quiet, evidently, after this, having been shown uh, to be full of shit. Um, it's kind of interesting. He also talks about uh, different leaders. He praises the city leaders of London and different parishes in London that evidently he he liked. Uh, you know, most of them were very active. None of them issued their duties. But again, none of these people. I'm trying not to be overly political right now. All of these people um, got their positions. You can say, oh, they yeah, they were kind of elective, but you didn't do it because you were good luck. You weren't in the position because you were good looking or you, you baffled, you know, gabbled some words about whatever made people feel good. You were expected to get things done. So people who are in these positions already had had experience of being responsible for all sorts of things. And there had been waves of plague before. Um, so uh, he, he has praise for them, but he does, uh, and that's for the regular secular leaders, but he has some nasty things to say about some of the religious, uh, the priests, and this is, of course, Anglican, uh, running to the countryside away from their parishioners and leaving uh, lower people down um, and people who got abandoned. But he also praises there were people who stayed, some of who died from the plague and some survived and helped their flocks. Uh, but this is it, you know, this is what's nice about this book is, and it's not very long, actually. I did the audio book, and I think it was only four hours. I can't remember. It wasn't that long. Um, and maybe it was 10 hours. It doesn't matter. Most of the audio books I get are like 20 to 30 hours long in length. So I, it's got a lot of good stuff in there. He had his own very specific to the plague, but his argument, and I've seen people make it um, recently, is no, don't quarantine people in their homes with their family because the rest of the family, they're going to be despairing. They don't necessarily have hope. And then you have the servants and all of that. Um, you should have pest houses and they did exist where you remove the sick people to the pest houses and keep the sick people away from the well people. And I've seen this uh, being, um, even for people who are asymptomatic, to separate those who are positive with coronavirus away from those who are negative, because even uh, a lot of these people may be asymptomatic or very mild symptoms. Uh, you might end up infecting somebody for whom it would be a far more serious. Uh, so staying in place with one sick person, getting everyone else sick. And that happened, I think, to a New Jersey family and four of them ended up dead. Uh, you know, that that's not the best approach. Of course, and this was his point, and it's the point now, you need to have the capacity to do that. They are uh, setting up temporary hospital, hospitals, but it will be interesting. You're only removing the people who have symptoms so severe that they need hospitalization. You can still end up with people who are positive with the virus, again, infecting other people within a household. So again, you know, wash your hands, 
Don't touch your face. That's tough. And I'm sure I've touched my face several times. Um, but wash your hands a lot. Um, I'm promoting, no one's paying me. This stuff is great working hands by O'Keefe's. I bought it on Amazon. Uh, there's also bag balm and someone was telling me about some other stuff. Um, I think it's the paraffin that really does it. Um, my hands have been rubbed raw from all the hand washing and this stuff has been fabulous. Um, but it, it's tough. Hang in there. We're going to hang in there. I do. There are some good news coming out of this and there was good news. The foes book is not all. Uh, depression and of course it did eventually end and <laughs> uh, London burned down the next year hmm uh, but that may be related to why the plague didn't come back in a big way uh, in London because that fire may have cleared out a whole bunch of stuff and when they came back and rebuilt uh, London after the great fire a lot of the plans they did made for a more hygienic town um, and a lot of the, the stuff that made it so easy for this to spread so rapidly um, went away. So anyway, see you around. Hang in there.